Hey guys, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Play Productions. Well, with the recent release of the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters on consoles and the upcoming release of Final Fantasy 16, it seemed like a good time to uh, kind of reflect on my personal history with the Final Fantasy series since I've been playing them, most of them anyway, since the very beginning. Um, and uh, so just to kind of reflect on that and to try and figure out, if I could, in a ranked order, what my top five Final Fantasy games are. Now, what I've come up with uh, might fall in a different order if you ask me next week, so don't give too much weight to the particular order, especially of the top two, I would say. Uh, I would also tell you up front that neither of the MMOs were even considered because I don't consider them mainline Final Fantasy games. Yes, they are numbered in that way, but I think that is that was probably a marketing ploy to really get people to take them seriously and make them feel like they would miss be missing out if they didn't try them, you know. But they clearly seem to fall in a wildly different category than other Final Fantasy games, even among those Final Fantasy games like, say, 12, that really changed the combat formula in some major ways. There's still a, a world of difference between Final Fantasy 12 and the actual MMO Final Fantasies. So uh, they are not being even, I, I'd never played either of them because I just, I have no interest in MMOs. Um, also, perhaps to the surprise of some, Final Fantasy 7 is nowhere on this list. Um, that game was a big deal at the time. It was a big deal to me at the time. Largely, I think, because of the jump forward in tech that that game represented in its visuals and the fact that it was many gamers' first Final Fantasy. A lot of people over and over again that I hear say that's their favorite, it also happens to have been their first, you know, and so I, I think that is playing a significant role as well. But the visuals of Final Fantasy VII have aged more poorly, I think, than any other Final Fantasy game, um, and there are several other Final Fantasy stories that had a lot more impact on me than Final Fantasy VII. Uh, so anyway, that said, here I go, my attempt at a top five Final Fantasy list. Uh, number five, I gotta give it to the original Final Fantasy. Um, and, and it has a lot to do with what it was at the time, but there are still elements of it that I think uh, help it to really hold up well on its own today. Dragon Warrior on the NES in the West, or Dragon Quest, as the series is actually known uh, these days, and Final Fantasy were my first video game RPGs. Final Fantasy really went ab above and beyond Dragon, we Dragon Quest or Dragon Warrior because it had character classes that you chose at the beginning, a whole party of characters that you chose and named at the beginning. I mean, you only had four uh, characters to work with, four like letters to work with when you're naming them, but it had attack and spell animations. You saw your characters actually doing their attacks and casting their spells spells. It had fantastic enemy variety, numerous spells and equipment to acquire, to use. It still holds up, I think, really well, especially in the some of the updated versions, um, like Final Fantasy Origins that later came to the PlayStation. And there's PSP versions, you know, as well, that I think uh, uh, hold up pretty well. I, I don't have as much experience with those, but also one of the things that I think helps it hold up is it was really focused on the turn-based dungeon crawl experience. Uh, yes, it did have townspeople that you could interact with that would say things and stuff, but it wasn't the same level of getting lost in towns, figuring out who you need to talk to in order to advance the story. The, the, the Final Fantasy um, series and JRPGs in general all got kind of cluttered up with that kind of stuff to the point where you, you needed a strategy guide uh, often to figure out what where am I supposed to go next? What do I need to do or who do I need to talk to to trigger the thing that's going to unlock my progression through the story, you know? And there was just a lot less of that in part because the NES just wasn't up for it in terms of the, the complexity that, that could be allowed for. But what that means is that in the design it was much more streamlined and focused on crawling the dungeons, getting stronger and repeating and and then moving on to the next dungeon, which is going to have some big boss fight at the end of it as well, you know. Um, so I think that it, it really has the core of what I like in so many of these types of games from this time period and even still today. It also has a crazy time travel concept, despite not being really story heavy. The villain has this crazy time travel concept revealed at the end that kind of blew my mind the first time I finished the game. It's one of the few Final Fantasies that I have played through from beginning all the way to the end more than once. Um, so anyway, yeah, Final Fantasy V, I have, I have no uh, problems with putting that as number five on this list. Number four, 
I'm going to give to Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, really, if you look at the up visuals from like the remastered edition, which I picked up, I don't know, a month or so ago, <clears throat> I think it holds up much better. Already there was a significant jump from Final Fantasy VII to Final Fantasy VIII in terms of the textures and the number of polygons, whereas seven you're playing in characters that are made of triangles. <laughs> Final Fantasy VIII felt much more uh, detailed in its models and in its textures. It had a more mature uh, style to the sprites, uh, where the, the heads weren't oversized like they'd been up to that point. It has great enemy designs, as do all the Final Fantasy games, and a great variety of them. This game, Final Fantasy VIII, had this unique draw system where instead of like um, MP, you used copies of spells that you largely acquired in combat by drawing them out of enemies, as though every creature in the world has some kind of a magical essence of a certain type in them, and you can keep pulling that out of them and stalking uh, uh, copies of these spells. Um, and so it, it had this weird kind of collectathon vibe to it that I didn't even realize would appeal to me at the time, but certainly did. And uh, years ago, I, I played through this game again. I was distracted during the last five to ten hours or so, so I didn't finish it, but um, I recently bought the remastered version. And and uh, introduced it to my son, who's really like uh, in enjoying what he's seeing so far. Uh, I, I did hear recently from a commentator that this game was known for its level scaling, so that grinding didn't really help you become more powerful. In fact, it could actually work against you and make the game more difficult. That was news to me. That, that wasn't my experience in either my first full playthrough or my second mostly full playthrough of the game. So I don't really know what that's about. Maybe because my version of grinding was more about drawing spells from enemies, just like getting to a point where I could kill them anytime I wanted, and I'm just drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and like getting a massive stockpile of spells, you know. And So uh, Final Fantasy VIII, in addition to that draw system and, and its other strengths is just meat and potatoes Final Fantasy. And that's probably one of the main reasons that Final Fantasy VIII is number four on my list. Uh, number three, I'm going to give to Final Fantasy VI, or as I have always known it, Final Fantasy III. Even when I came back for, you know, a second playthrough, it was still on my uh, Super Nintendo cartridge. Uh, I tried a little bit of one of the, the, the PS1 version, but the, the loading in the menus was really weird and, yeah, off-putting. Uh, Many would agree that Final Fantasy VI is the strongest of the pixel art era of Final Fantasy, and I'm in agreement with that. For its day, it also had really heavy drama going on. In terms of what kinds of emotions they could show, which was still very limited, uh, the story that was being told was one that was largely serious, and it had a twisted villain in Kefka, who I think is still arguably the strongest villain in Final Fantasy history. There is a massive cast of recruitable characters with diverse abilities, each of them kind of representing one of the uh, classical uh, classes or uh, job types of previous Final Fantasy games. Um, so you didn't have the job system where you could choose a job for a character. They kind of came preloaded with a, as a character class in themselves. Uh, but such a diverse amount of abilities that each different character brought, in addition to the ability for everyone to learn any spell if you wanted to, to train them up in a particular spell. Um, you can, I mean, the story is like this literally earth-shattering thing that lets you experience what happens when the good guys fail to save the world and then have to recover from that. I mean, that was just, uh, wow, that, that was really something to experience in a video game that had never gone to that place before in my, uh, in my past playing other games. It still has beautiful spell animations. Um, it, it's got a clever and satisfying spell learning system that's attached to the summon monsters where you kind of equip one of the espers, the summon monsters, and for as long as you have them equipped, you can learn certain spells that they're able to teach you at a certain speed that's represented by a percentage you know, amount in battles, you know, and so you can, you're trading, you're swapping who's equipping what Esper to teach certain spells at certain speeds and stuff, and so it's a, it was a neat system that made the grind uh, interesting and rewarding, and the, the, the drama also hung a lot on the Espers, the summon monsters, and uh, uh, so yeah, I really love that aspect of it. Uh, this is another Final Fantasy game that I've nearly played twice, not quite all the way to the end, but it's one of the most impactful video game experiences I have had. So I have no problems putting Final Fantasy VI, or as I know it, three, uh, as number three, appropriately enough, on my list. Number two, 
Final Fantasy IX. Um, this one was the last Final Fantasy on the original PlayStation 1. The remastered versions, I think, still look great. Uh, it's a celebration of the trappings and aesthetics of the series, particularly, the, I, I would say, the pixel art era with mages with the straw steeple hats and things like that. But it's got a story that gives new context to those elements. Um, I, I nearly played this one twice as well. There's a difficulty spike near the last boss that I, you know, was, of course, my first time through willing to grind and grind for a while at the end there to, to be ready for. But I wasn't quite up for it the second time through. Uh, so I think I just watched a YouTube video the rest of the game at that point. Um, but Final Fantasy IX, I'll always remember it as a very personal experience to me. I played it while dating my wife, um, and I named the protagonist after me, and he also happened to be a dishwater blonde, uh, as I was at the time. My hair was more brown, just straight up brown now. But at the time, I was more of a dishwater blonde, and that wasn't a very common hair color uh, in, uh, in characters at the time. So, uh, so And then the princess was a brunette. My wife is also a brunette. And so I named the princess after her. It wasn't clear when you're naming these characters at the beginning that there's going to be a romance between these two characters. And so it really took me by surprise that there was this love story between these two characters that were named after me and the woman I was dating who would later become my wife. And it was really, I think, the first time I connected with romance in a story. I think I was watching Farscape around the same time and so probably that as well. Uh, but it was really noteworthy for that because I'd never been in any kind of, you know, a real real relationship before um, and so I was experiencing and relating to these feelings for the first time with this game the princess there's a moment there's a there's a, a key reunion between her and the protagonist near the end where she's just crying it's a, it's a CGI animated scene she's crying and runs up to him and 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 she's also when after hugging him then kind of pulls away from him and is like beating him on the chest like how could you put me through that you know there's no voice acting in that moment but it was just showing this mix of emotions that i wasn't used to seeing in expressed in video games and that also really connected with me because of the stage of life that i was in and so it was the first video game maybe the only one in my memory that that ever made me cry uh and in addition to of course all the meat and potatoes elements of a classic turn-based Final Fantasy game with its all its numerous spells and interesting characters and interesting abilities and and uh, and world and variety of monsters, all those other things still very very present, um, but with these other enhancements that uh, both brought it forward in terms of what Final Fantasy was and also looked back and celebrated what Final Fantasy had been before. So uh, Final Fantasy IX is my number two. Always going to have a really really uh, special place in my memory. And that brings me to my number one Final Fantasy game, which I would say right now is Final Fantasy XII. Not the Zodiac Age version that was released recently on consoles with, you know, with remastered visuals and stuff. Final Fantasy XII was a weird choice. Uh, I just admit that up front. It's very different from the others in the series. Uh, I liked it fine the first time I played it. Once I got used to it, I was really unsure. Any, I really disliked the active time battle system when it was introduced uh, in the series. When it was just straight turn-based, I much preferred that uh, because you know then I wouldn't have to feel pressured when it's a tough fight or feel bored and waiting when it's an easy fight while I'm watching for waiting for that ATB bar to, to fill up. Um, so anything that moved into the real time space at that time was really making me stressed and uncomfortable because I was just not good at action games and I didn't do well under pressure, you know? Uh, and, and this one was much more of that, although you could pause at any time and that really made a big difference. But it was the first real time with pause game that I had ever played. Uh, and so it really had had to grow on me for a while. So the fact that it's number one on my list is not based solely on my first time playing it. I came back to Final Fantasy XII after playing Neverwinter Nights for the first time on the PC, which was uh, then my, you know, I guess my, my first Western real-time with pause uh, RPG. And I think I also played Dragon Age Origins maybe before coming back for a second playthrough. So both of those games really took their combat systems ultimately from uh, Baldur's Gate and Baldur's, Baldur's Gate 2. Uh, and so coming back and, and after appreciating those types of games in Neverwinter Nights and Dragon Age Origins, I came back and just had a totally different experience of Final Fantasy XII the second time. 
I loved it. It felt amazing. It was also such a huge open feeling world. There were optional monster uh, hunting quests to do on the side. The story is mostly boring and confusing to me. Um, even on a second and third playthrough, uh, it has too many proper nouns and terms for me to keep track of. <laughs> I wish it was a tighter story with an ensemble cast, sure, but that really had a, a couple of main characters that you're just focusing on their story, you know. But the gameplay, man, oh, it's fantastic. And you create custom AI behaviors in between battles to, to kind of figure out, okay, if this happens in combat, then I have him do this. So it's kind of like this programming language a little bit, uh, but you're, you're just basically activating switches and, and making an order of priority of things that your guys will, your, your characters in your party will do during combat. Um, so, but then after doing that in between battles now and then and watching your master plan unfold some people would say all oh, this game is boring it plays itself but that's not the game that's not the meat of the game that's just the reward for doing a good job between battles of setting up your ai commands and then of course you know uh you're going to find new enemies come along with abilities that your programming isn't accounting for yet. And so you're going to have to intervene now and then to make some corrections. So you're in this master plan supervisory kind of capacity, and then you intervene when needed to do more specific things. But I, I just really like that kind of that kind of gameplay. It's possibly my favorite type of um RPG mechanics, combat mechanics. So uh, the remastered visuals, though, of the, the Zodiac Age version that's come to consoles in the last few years, they really do look fantastic. I mean, they they almost sit in with, with PS4 visuals. Uh, the, the job system in the Zodiac Age, I do think feels too confining for me, because originally you could just have any character learn any skill and any spell, and they kind of changed that. I wish that. I really wish that would have been an optional mode for these remastered visuals versions. I am glad that they've since added respec options, so I feel at least uh, a little less kind of uh, stuck in a character class if I decide, oh, I don't like this, I want access to these abilities instead. But I still prefer um, the openness of the character building that was available in the original release. So that is really the version that is at the top of my list. Um, th there's so much game here, and there's still tons to do even after finishing the story. I didn't realize that after my first playthrough, but after my second playthrough, I really dug in. I was like, oh my gosh, there's this whole sprawling optional dungeon and all these extra super hard boss encounters and stuff I can optionally go hunt down out, out in the world. And um, So it's easily the Final Fantasy game that I have put the most time into, both in terms of the game length itself, just on a single playthrough, um, and, and the optional content. And then, of course, I've done uh, two finished playthroughs, two complete playthroughs of the main campaign. And I currently have a, a save that's halfway through the remastered version. Those first two playthroughs were just on the original version. The, the halfway save I've got right now is on the remastered version. So um, it's also the last Final Fantasy game that I completed. With 13 and 15, I, I felt like the series really got away from what I love about uh, Final Fantasy. I mean, so did 12 in some ways, but those at least happened to be ways that I liked as it diverted. I'm hoping that the radical changes we're seeing in previews for the combat of Final Fantasy 16, taking into it a full-on action RPG combat system, I'm hoping that they will like Final Fantasy XII did, maybe even more so would be ideal, surprise me um, with a very different but enjoyable combat experience. I'm ready to be a Final Fantasy series fan again. I would love to uh, be able to say that this was the beginning point of it getting back onto a path that really connected with me, um, but Final Fantasy XVI is going to really need to be a turning point in order for that to happen. Um, I'm also interested to see what uh, thematic ideas Final Fantasy XVI might play with. The series has been for me, or was, especially early on, an introduction to Eastern religious influences in entertainment. And I think we've seen Eastern philosophy help influence and shape the Western secular pop spirituality that has unfortunately developed and become so common in the last two to three decades, also thanks to properties like Star Wars. So I'll once again be leaning forward to see what Final Fantasy 16 might have to say about some of the big core issues of life, such as the origins, purpose, and destiny of humanity. Um, I guess we'll all find out in June when Final Fantasy 16 releases. But that's all I have to say for now. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>